Family crisis intervention, Sergeant Balzac. I'm calling from Paris. I have a son who's home alone. Has a child been involved in a violent altercation with drunk and or mentally ill member of his immediate family? No. Has he been involved in a household accident? I don't know. I don't. I. I, I hope not. Oh, that's has child ingested yeah, any yeah. poison and or any other object has become lodged in his throat? No, he's just home alone, and I'd like somebody to go over to the house and see that he's all right, just to check on him. You want us to go to your house just to check on him? Yes. Can you connect with the police department? No, they just. You know, folks, that's one of the best clips of the movie Home Alone, which came out, ironically, in 1990 and is still going strong. And the gentleman who you just listened to, that's just one of a billion parts he's played over his career. He's been in Breaking Bad. He's been in Friends. He's been in Seinfeld. He's been in um, Running Scared. I mean, you think about it, the list goes on and on. And I'm, I haven't even scratched the surface, but we're honored to have him on today. He's also a director a producer, a writer, a comedian, the one and only Larry Hankin. And Larry, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. You know, Larry, um, let me ask you, I, I always wondered about this. Uh, throughout your career, you've been known as a character actor. You've been in a million shows. You've done a lot of films. What it, What is it like to be a character actor? Because like you could be, you must constantly be working all the time even though you're not on a steady show all the time the amount of shows that you guest star in you must have been working non-stop well not really i mean there's there's months sometimes in between shows so <clears throat> I, I i guess in a way as an actor yeah i work a lot not as much as once a week, like if I was on an ep episodic, but, um, and then you have to audition each time. Like if you're on an episodic, right. yeah, do it once. And then you got four years or seven or whatever. So, um, it's, it's kind of, I'm working a lot and it's all nonstop, but it's really not. I mean, because part, part of the, um, the nonstop is just auditioning. Yeah. I mean, because yes, I, I've done I, now. I don't follow me. I, I, I have, I have no interest in myself <laughs> right. as an image on the screen. But, <laughs> um, I, I, I do know that uh, in between all this work, I, I think it's the 202 is the number of, of shows I've been in, uh, jobs I've had um, but in between all that work there's all those auditions which drive me up a wall I don't know if it does other actors but because sometimes you have to audition out in the valley I mean that like that kills my whole day man <laughs> yeah <laughs> I can imagine yeah yeah so uh, I mean you you may see it as, wow, this guy works nonstop. But to me, it's like half of that time is a bother, you know, putting on the cost, going for costume changes, costume yeah. fittings and stuff. So it's not, uh, and that's why I wrote the book. I mean, uh, I don't know if you, you mentioned it. I don't know if you mentioned it, but I wrote a book called That 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 Guy. Yeah, and the reason yeah. I wrote it is I just wanted everybody to know that it's not what you think at all. I mean, yeah. I never wanted to be an actor. I mean, it never occurred to me that that's, that's a good way to make a living. Uh, it is, but uh, I, it never occurred to me to do that. Uh, I, I just fell into it, and the money was good, so I just stuck with it. But it wasn't a dream or, you know, I didn't, you know, oh, mom, dad, I want to I be an actor. It wasn't one of those. I just, I want to be a, maybe a stand-up comedian was, was something I thought about when I was a kid because I used to watch, you know, the funny stuff. You know, right. the girl show and all that stuff. So I thought, well, you know, funny is, is a way to go. I, I can be funny. You know, and I was funny in school. But yeah, it's not, it's not what you think. That, that's all I'm saying. Right. Now, um, you are an early member of... Uh theater group or i think it was a theater group called second city if yeah. i'm not mistaken talk about second city a little bit 
Well, uh, that was fun. I mean, improv is is the best. Uh, uh, if you're going to be on a stage in front of an audience, I would choose me personally. Stand-up comedian, which I was, and I, I did it very well, and I loved it. It's just that the police kind of killed that dream. And, uh, you know, it was the whole Lenny Bruce thing. Uh, so some, uh, so I said, hey, I called my manager, who was Woody Allen's manager. So, I mean, he had some clout. He knew what was going on. Uh, you know, Woody was kind of famous when I started. And I was opening for Woody for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I branched out into nightclubs and stuff like that, opening for just, you know, great acts and stuff. Kingston Trio, Miles Davis, et cetera. And then uh, I, I, you know, got into critical thinking. <laughs> George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, uh, Richie Pryor, Bill Burr, all that stuff. But be, this is way before Bill Burr. Bill Burr is now okay. You can do yeah. that. Back in the day, Lenny Bruce was being busted and I pulled off the stage by police. And so was I. I mean, I, I wasn't copying him. I was just doing stuff that I thought was funny. You know, I didn't see any reason not to make fun of religion or politics or sex, drugs and rock and roll. I mean, it just I, I, and I, all I was doing was making fun of it. And it, I wasn't even, quote, cursing nor was Lenny Bruce, because I used to watch him. I used to go to his shows. You know, he was great. He was funny. But he was just being conversational. There's a difference, a huge difference. It's one thing to say, you know, hey, fuck you. That's cursing. Yeah. But to say, you know, well, I, I, I didn't, you know, well, I thought, you know, well, fuck that. I'll just go over, you know, and talk to him. Well, that's conversational. So that's what he was doing. He's just talking street. He was just yeah. talking like he talks to his friends. If you go to a, a well, I was in, in those days, it was nightclubs. But uh, when I went to a nightclub to see Lenny Bruce, it was like we were sitting in his living room and he was just telling us what he did today. You know, hey, blah, 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 blah. But the cops just pulled him off the stage. I go, what the? Fuck? And, you know, like that. What the fuck? I mean, if he said that on the stage, boom, cops, wham. Yeah. And I thought that was insane. But the audiences loved him. He, he was just so, see, he was funny and nobody ever talked about that. You know, he was, but I had, so I joined, I called my manager and I said, look, this is not fun anymore, man. You know, I, I like to make people laugh, but the cops and the coming on the stage and taking me off, that's not fun. And then it confuses the audience. And then, you know, it interrupts my pay. Yeah. So he said, join Second City. So that's how I got there. He said, they're doing the same thing as Pryor and Lenny and, and Richie, but they own the theater. So the cops can't come in unless they pay a price and sit in the audience. Uh, but they can't touch you. It's our place, you know. So that so that's what happened, and they they killed Lenny by saying you can't work in any place that served liquor. That that's what they put on him, the judge, the judgment. Well, that was nightclubs. So if you can't perform where they serve liquor, you're dead. I mean, you you have to get a you know you get a cubby hole and go into advertising. It, it just doesn't work. So that's why. And then when the cops were pulling me off the stage and before I joined Second City, the, I wasn't doing drugs. I, I was a late bloomer. I didn't do any kind. I didn't even smoke marijuana until I was at 30 or something. I mean, uh, you know, so um, it, it, just, it just didn't work. Uh, I wasn't doing drugs and the cops were pulling me off the stage. So there was really no reason except for my language, which was conversational. So they, they had nothing that, so he said, join Second City. So I did. And then we went to the committee and then the committee was in San Francisco, like Second City Improv. And that's great because you can just make it up. You don't have to do research. You know, you just, yeah. 
it, 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 that, that was really great. But we could curse and we could do critical thinking material. We could do politics and religion and sex and drugs and rock and roll. And there was nobody bothering us. And it was really great. And I wanted to stay there. Then we broke away from Second City, went to the committee in San Francisco. And we had lines around the block. But we also attracted people from Hollywood to come up to see the show. And they would hire us for a week or a day or, you know. But we always had the job back in San Francisco. So it was kind of cool. You know, good money down there. Come back and, you know, just improvise. Always had a job waiting for us. And then I decided the money was much bigger. Everybody did in our company, in, in the committee. We went down to uh, Hollywood and we just stayed. They didn't come back. You know, <laughs> we had to replace them. They go, well, I'm going down for a week, you know. Okay. Yeah. They go down and that was it. Well, hey, what happened to, you know, Gary? Uh, well, he's down in Hollywood now. He's making, you know, he's got a sitcom or whatever. Uh, Howard Hessman, you know, yeah. Mel Stewart, Peter Bonners. So all of them, they were in second, they were in the committee with me. So on a I didn't lot of ways. Excuse yeah, me? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, well, <clears throat> there was no reason for me to go down there. I mean, the money was good and I would go down for a day or so. But I didn't, it, was, it, was, it wasn't my shtick. It wasn't my people. It, it wasn't. I just didn't, it was not that I didn't get along. It was just with the costume changes and you can't say this and don't say that. And I can say it funnier. Well, don't say it. Just do it. Stand over there. Wear this. I don't want to. I mean, that's what was going on with me. I, I just, it wasn't working out. I, I didn't see eye to eye with Hollywood. So that's why I wrote the book. I mean, all the stuff in the book is funny. Yeah. But it's real. You know, that's what I went through. And, you know, and I, I didn't write a funny book. I just wrote the truth. And the truth is funny sometimes, really funny. So, you know, it's a funny book. But uh, when people come and say, you know, I loved your writing. It's so funny. I go, I didn't write a funny book. Yes, you did. And then I read it because I had lag time. You know, I had about six months between putting it out and people saying, hey, it's funny. So I read it and I go, oh yeah, it is funny, but that, that's not that's not what I what I was writing when I wrote it. It was yeah, coming from my heart and it went right to my head, you know. Right. So in a lot of ways, uh acting kind of came to you. You didn't come to acting. So it's funny yeah. how that works out. Um and I think like uh you had a lead role early on in your career in the early sixties. I think it was called uh, Too Tough to Care. You played Farley. Uh it was like an educational film. I mean, talk about that a little bit. Because, you know, that big, you know, that first big film you do or where you have a lead character is always important. You know, you kind of want to, you know, start off on the right foot. Well, yeah, I did. But I, I've watched it a couple of times. And I don't think it's very good. And I don't think I'm very good. I mean, I, I just cringe when I watch what I do. But you're right. When I went into that, when they oh, you got the lead in it, uh, I thought, wow, man, um, you know, I can act now in, on, in a film. But I was just too over the top, you know. I mean, I didn't. I was still doing stage kind of acting, you know, a little broader, just a little uh, Im improv, improvisational type of stuff. But it doesn't work on camera. And in camera, you got to relax. You got to, you just got to be real, realer. And I didn't know that, but, you know, I, I learned, well, where I learned it was, I think the second or third movie that I ever did, it was really the first movie that I ever did because it was a real movie. It was a 10 pole movie called Escape from Alcatraz. Now that's the best acting I've ever done. I don't care, even yesterday. It, it, because what the director, um, uh, Don Siegel, what he saw when he, he didn't, he didn't audition me really. He talked to me. He called me in. I mean, it was an audition you go, but he didn't audition me. I, I, what he did was he talked to me. And he asked me about the role and we, we talked about the role. Uh, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the movie. I didn't because I didn't read the screenplay. I hadn't yet when he talked to me. 
uh, and uh, he he wanted to know what role I wanted to play in the movie. And not having read the screenplay, I thought he was putting me on or something. I thought this was a joke. I mean, it didn't seem like a real audition. I, I, I thought I was being either put on about five minutes into it because it was just discussion. We weren't, I, I, and then he said, well, what, what part do you want to play? And I, and I was just so astounded. That's never happened to me in an audition. I've only had, you know, at that time, maybe five or six. I didn't, yeah. I was just learning because I didn't want to be an actor. You know, this was all new. I was an improv. You don't, there's no audition for improv. So, um, and you got to do something instantaneously from the audience, you know? So I, kept on saying, well, well I, I don't know what part, I, I never read it. I got bothered. I mean, so I was being real. I was being honest. I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. So I expressed that and I was bothered. I was like, well, I don't understand. I, I haven't read the screenplay. Nobody gave me a screenplay. They said they would give me the screenplay here. And now you're asking me what part I want to play. I don't even know what the movie's about. So, he, Don Siegel, kind of, he, he, he understood and he just turned to the casting director. There's only three of us in the whole room, which is me, the director, and the casting director. And he turns to the director, he says, well, what parts are, are open? So now they're discussing this in front of me, which even more can be, I said, you people aren't, you people are in worse shape being ready for this than I am. That's what yeah. I found. You know, they're, now they're discussing it. Why didn't you just, oh, uh, anyway. So that was my attitude. I was just like, come on, man. Let, let's, what's going on? So then he said, okay, how about, uh, <laughs> he said, the first thing he said, okay, how about the guard? She said, there's only two parts open. Charlie Butts or the guard who beats up Clint Eastwood when he's in the solitary. He says, uh, well, uh, how would you like to do the guard? I said, I don't know because I don't have the part. I, I don't know if I want to do the part. And then she says, well, no, wait a minute. Um, two things. One is uh, he can't do the guard. He goes, why? And I go, and, and then she goes, well, um, we cast him this morning. And anyway, I don't think he can beat up Clint Eastwood. And then they're talking in front of me. Yeah. So he turns to me and he says, you think you can beat up Clint Eastwood? And I go, no, oh, no, I don't think so. And he goes, yeah, no, neither do I. No, he can. All right, forget the, forget the, uh, the, the guard, the guard, the guard. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about Charlie Butts? You want to do Charlie Butts? I thought I don't know, and I said it that way. <laughs> I don't know. I've never read anything. They said that you would give me the part. He. So, so I wanted to go home by this time. But when he said that, you know, you want to do Charlie Butts, I go, what? Why are you asking me? You're the. So I just wanted to get out of there, and then he said, "All right, look, you try Charlie." I said, "Yeah, okay, okay, I'll I'll try Charlie Butts." I, you know, I just wanted to get it over with. Okay, I'll try Charlie Butts. So he gives me a screenplay. He says, "Turn to turn to page 80. I'll read with you." And he takes her. Uh, no, he had, he had his own screenplay. He gives me one. He, he says, okay, turn to page 80. Okay, we'll read just, just that page. I'll read with you. You read Charlie Butts. Okay, yeah, you want to go outside and, you know, practice? No, no, I just want to do this because I wanted to go home. So I said, no, no, let's just do it. Okay. So he goes, blah, 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 and I go, blah, blah, blah. And so I don't know the character. I'm just reading it, you know, blah, blah, blah. He goes, blah, 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 blah. He says, okay. He did that. <laughs> you got the part. Now, they never tell you that. Never. Right. I, yeah. In all the years I've talked to other actors, they just don't. So he says, okay, you got the part. Just like that. And I just sat there thinking, I was thinking just, fuck you. You're just, now you're just pranking me. You know, and I didn't like that. Right. So I just sat down and I just looked at him. And he says, you don't believe me, do you? 
And he was like just being like fatherly, like friendly. No, my attitude was not impressing him at all. He just was kind of almost smirking at me. He goes, you, you don't, uh, says, what do you say? Oh, okay. He says, you got the part. And I go, you don't believe me. He says, you don't believe me, do you? I said, no, no, I don't. He says, I'll tell you what, you go home, sit by the phone and see what happens. Now get out of here. That's what he said. He said, now get out of here. He said it nicely, but he said, get right. out of here. Yeah. So I said, okay. And, and I thought, all right, I'll take you at your word. And I just walked out. So I'm driving back. I mean, it was in the valley. So I had like a 45 minute drive back. Yeah. And I'm just cursing. You know, what the fuck was that all about, man? Uh, you know, well, what is acting? Well, I don't, I don't like it. I get back to the house. I walk in and sure enough, in about 10 minutes, the phone rings and it's my agent. Hey, you got the part. Congratulations. And I go, what? Now the whole, yeah. So that's how I got the part. But the point that was made to me, I guess, and it took me years for it to really blossom in my head. He saw while he was talking to me with this attitude that I was going through and this, let me get out of here kind of antsiness. He saw that I wasn't an actor, that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And that's what he wanted for Charlie Butts. He just wanted this naive, you know, duh kind of, he was in, he was over the top. He got sent to a, a jail that he wasn't meant to be in. You know, he was yeah. meant to be in a local jail. And they sent this guy, Charlie Butts, to Alcatraz. So I, I, it dawned on me during the part, because I was there for three months, that, oh, I get it. Uh, the director wanted me to be who I am, Larry Hankin, basically, really, was because that meant that I had to stick close to Clint Eastwood's character because I didn't want to be beat up or somebody's girlfriend, the character. So the fact that I was so naive as a person was perfect for Charlie Butts, this guy who was in over his head, basically. And that was yeah. Larry, and that was Charlie Butts, and he saw that immediately. So no matter what I did, it was always more better for Charlie to, to Don Siegel. And Clint Eastwood also dug that. He, he, he saw the relationship, the character relationship. And I just stuck with Clint the entire three months. I mean, I just went everywhere because I wanted to get the awe, the, the awe off, off, of, off of Larry and just be Charlie and just hang around with Clint's character. So I, I never left this. I ate with him. You know, I just walked around with him. I just, and he, 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 he dug it. I mean, he, not he dug it. He understood it. Yeah. He, he saw what I was doing. So he, he, he let me do it. You know, he, yeah. Okay. You know, we're going and, over there now. And I think what's uh, very cool about you, Larry, is that you didn't just, take any part when they asked you if you wanted a part it sounds like you had to see the script you had to see if you would like playing this part you weren't just going to say yeah sure i'll take it well in the, in the yeah that that's that's what happened yeah i mean that was a slow transmogrification of my thinking but in the beginning no i would just do anything and sometimes i would i would because i needed the money and i didn't want to say no i was new in hollywood you know don't say no you know say yes so I always would take every part. I would go for every audition. You know, there's, as long as I was here and doing it, and the money was good if I would get the job. So, I mean, the impetus was get the job, not be an actor. Get the job, get the money, pay the rent. Yeah. Uh, that was the, the, the wheels, the energy. Um, but in the beginning, yeah, I would just take any job. And then my, my agent told me something that stuck with me. Uh, and I and I used it, and it applied to what you said. I got a, He gets on the phone. And he said, "Hey, I got a, um, uh, I, got, I got another job for you." And I said, "Okay, what is it?" And he says, "Blah blah blah blah, whatever it was." And I go, "Okay," and I didn't. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do it. And I think I went to the audition. Uh, the 
Yeah, I said, I, I don't know if I want to do this because it was just too too weird or what, it wasn't something I thought I could do. Whatever it was, I said to my agent, I don't, wow, man. He goes, what's the matter? I said, well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not, I don't know. I don't know if I, wow, man. It's just, you know, just going like that on the phone. And he says, well, if you don't want to do it, then turn it down. You know, because I'm not using up his time. He's got to make other phone calls. You know, and I'm, you know, oh, well, I don't know. He says, well, if you don't want to do it, turn it down. You know, I mean, just like that. Let's let's go. You know. So I said, well, you know, I don't know if I want to turn it down. Well, why not? Well, I don't know. You know, say no, and then I don't think they'll hire me again. What? <laughs> so she's incredible. I mean, that's how naive I am. Says, yeah, that's the perfect thing. Well, they might, might not. He said, well, that's well, no, crazy. Where'd you get that idea? Well, I don't know. It's just if you don't, you know, I just didn't want to turn anything down. Because I'm thinking like temp jobs or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I just, what, well, it's a job. So he says, no, if you don't want to do it, just turn it down. Larry, and this is what stuck with me. He says, look, Larry, you got to have a no, man. You just can't go through life just taking every job people throw at you. You know, if I call you and you don't want to do the job, just tell me. We turn it down. No, no big deal. They'll call you again. They get turned down all the time. Yeah. I said, "Oh, okay. Well, I don't want to do it." He says, "Fine, great. I'll tell them no." Click. Goodbye. And uh, and then after that, man, I was like, "Wow, I can turn shit down, man." Well, they see the cops would be on the stage right now. Boom. Okay, you said said shit. All right, you're out. Uh, so, uh, from then on, I, it kind of, I, I started to get what acting was and there's, it's not all bad. It's good. You can turn down. There's good parts. There's bad parts. So I became, you know, an actor. I started to see what it was all about. I still would have preferred to be in improv up in San Francisco or in Chicago, but like I say, the money was good. And that, and then it's also a trap. And, and nobody knows about this. I've never heard it talked about. Although I think every actor goes through it. Uh, and that is the trap of the money being so good that you start to buy things. Yeah. Like a car, like a new car as opposed to a used car. Or a better apartment or a house. Now, once you do that, you've crossed the line of independence because now you got to pay for the car and the, the house, house yeah. or the apartment and acting it has nothing to do with acting you need another job and so that's what becomes the engine i got to get another job because i got two kids and a house to pay for i mean so and you're on now you're on the treadmill and this is an art form. Treadmill was an art form. Now yeah. a treadmill. And I saw that and I was on it. And I hated it. You know, I, I just needed to get another job because I had a really cool apartment. So uh, and then 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 I was looking for an out, you know. And I think bar and also I'm dyslexic. I mean the parts were getting bigger. And it was hard for me to memorize the stuff. You know, it would take me, you know, two days, three days, four days, a week to memorize the parts getting bigger and bigger. And, and then they started to write stuff. Like Vince Gilligan would start to write stuff for me, which seems like a great, you know, perk. But no, because then the parts weren't getting bigger, but the monologues were getting bigger. And that's different. When you're talking to somebody, it's easy to memorize because they say this, you just give them an answer to that. Yeah. So you have kind of an in, a hint as to what you're going to. But a monologue is just, you know, a page or two. You know, I, I was getting a page. Vince Gilligan wrote a page. And that was just, hey, man, I, how long do I have? He, well, two hours. Two hours. I need like, you know, three days. Well, we're going to shoot it in two hours. So in that particular instance, what I did was, and they couldn't stop me because they were shooting. I mean, we're on, on schedule. I just improvised it. <laughs> 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 well, surprise, I'm not going to say it the way you wrote it. 
but it worked out. You know, I, I happened to just be able to improvise it. They did it twice. I mean, the first time it was a surprise. You know, I just, it was keeping keeping the cop mm -hmm. out of the Winnebago. You yeah, know? So it had to be all legal improv, which was the, what was the monologue was. It was but uh, I couldn't memorize it, so I just improvised some legalese, you know, based on what I saw and what I could kind of remember and blah blah blah. But it wasn't verbatim. And the and the director, I didn't know this, but the director wrote the monologue. So he knew I was improvising. I, I thought I was fooling everybody. I didn't yeah. stutter. I didn't make, you know, I just kept talking this legal improv. And I got to the end and he goes, okay, just let's do it again. Just like that. I mean, like, he, I said, wow, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I did memorize it was what I thought. I thought, did I say it exactly right? Because he didn't blink. He didn't say anything. He did. I got to the end and he goes, okay, let's just do it once more. You know, and he even said, we got it in the can. Let's just do it again for insurance. So I thought, well, wow, that was really easy. That was great. And he got it in the can. So <coughs> I don't have to worry about stuttering or, or anything. Well, I'll just do it again. I, of course, you can't improvise exactly the same. So I just did it again. And they said, thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And he put me in the car and sent me back to the production company. I couldn't figure out what had happened. And when I watched it, I suddenly realized that, first of all, before I got in the car, I said, who wrote this? And the script lady said, oh, the director wrote it. And I went, oh, man, he knew. And, you know, I got in the car and I'm trying to tell, wow. Well, then he knew I was improvising it. Then why didn't he say something? He said nothing. Right. Great and boom. When I watched it, what they did was, and he knew this, is he saw this guy, again, you know, this guy doesn't know his ass from a, a hole in the wall. He's the, okay. And he immediately started to, you know, we're, we're, sh we're shooting now. I mean, time is money. We can't go back. I can't. So he said, I'll fix it in post. I'll have him do it again. And we'll edit it as a, as a voiceover. The two, the two improvs that he did, into one thing that keeps the cop out of the Winnebago. And if you watch the scene, I mean, it's like maybe nine seconds. Mm -hmm. It's just cutting back and forth from the cop to the inside of the Winnebago. And you just hear my voice. But when I asked all my friends, you know, what did you see in that scene? Because I was going to tell them what happened. They said, well, you were walking and talking and keeping the cop out of the Winnebago. I said, no, that's not what you saw at all. Now, what do you think? What did you see? I'm not talking about what the scene was about. What did you see? You were walking and talking and keeping the cop out of the window. No. There was like nine seconds of me. Every time I said something correctly for two seconds, he would quickly pop to me. You know, boop, da, uh, stay out of the Winnebago. Boom. And then <laughs> back. Uh, so it worked perfectly. So... And that's in the book too. I, you know, it's just, I was just making do for years, but it, it seemed to work. You know, everybody seemed to like what I was doing, but I was just making do, you know, oh, I got to pay the rent. I'll do this. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Or, you know. And what's, so, what I find remarkable about you, Larry, is a lot of people obviously get into stage act and whatever it is, because there's a part of them that wants the fame. I mean, it's important to kind of make it big, but it sounds like to me, you enjoy it, but you look at it as a job more than anything else. You don't necessarily look at it for fame. Not, no, not at all. I thought if I thought about fame, uh, I would be pissed off, depressed, you know, because you know, fame, you got to get on. Well, first of all, you have to have a fire in the belly that is uh, uh, inextinguishable. I, I, you know, you, uh, no, no, no. I don't care. No, what, no, I'm not looking for a no. I'm looking for stardom. So get out of my way, basically. Uh, and, and I've seen it in, in people who are stars, man. There's certain, there's a certain wall that you, you know, that they have up about about where they're going. Maybe I don't think it's a wall. I think it's a guidepost. I think it's sidewalls. You know, 
they're going this way. And they don't, you know, any, anything that comes at them from the side is, and they just boom. And I didn't have that, I, you know, because I never wanted to be an actor. It never occurred to me when I was growing up. Uh, or, or even when I graduated college, I, I'm an industrial designer. You know, that's what I got a degree in industrial design. So uh, I didn't think the way an actor thought. I, I thought, well, you know, funny. I, I, I can make people laugh, you know, at a party or whatever. So I thought, well, you know, that I, so I, stand up comedy would be my desire. And I, I did that and I loved it, but. The cops, you know, so you have to make do. I got to pay the rent. I got to get along. Right. So I got I got into acting a whole different way than anybody else. You know, I, I could never give anybody advice as to how to be an actor. Uh, I, I don't, I would, if I had to start over again, I wouldn't know how to do it. And think about this, though, Larry. I mean, look at everything you've done. I mean, you've had... Even if it was only a few episodes, you had Parts and Friends, Seinfeld, I mean, Home Improvement. And then another thing I wanted to ask you is um, you were in several John Hughes films. I mentioned Home Alone. So, I mean, you had to have a great relationship with him as well. I mean, I he has had some iconic movies, but I mean, just talk about him a little bit and working with him. Uh, well, I never understood him at all. He was a mystery to everybody. Uh, he, yeah. he can, he's very shy. He keeps to himself. He's kind of um, passive aggressive. Uh, I'd say. I mean, not that he was ever really aggressive, but he was completely <laughs> passive. And every once in a while, he would just uh, get moody. He yeah. would really get moody and and say, "All right, well, we're leaving now." You know, you know, he took us to a party. Well, the reason I think that I, I was in so many of his movies was he liked my character acting. Yeah. He liked what I did on screen. He liked my characters. So when he wrote some of these, oh, Larry would be great in this. I mean, that's how obviously how he thought because he hired me. I think I did three movies with him. Yeah, three. So, uh, but I never got along with him. And I, and I disappointed him one time where I thought I would... Uh, be do something funny and he thought oh great let's film it but what i said was he said we we went to a party he took five five of his actors with him uh three character actors and two of the leads in um home uh, in uh, she's having a baby yeah we went to a party you know like, like a and this was in Chicago. So it was like, uh, what is it? Uh, Studio 54 in, in New York. A place like that. Except without the drugs. Right. Without, you know, without all that bullshit. It, it was just a big, huge, you know, party. Wow. Bands, you know, four different floors with an atrium so you could look down. Big party in Chicago. So he went and he said, okay, everybody, he said to the, the driver and the five of us and his wife. And he said, everybody just go have fun. Check back every once in a while, you know, go. And he just sat on a, on a, on a bench in, in this building. It, it was a party building. I, 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 that's all you could do is throw yeah. parties in this building. So he just sat down and he said, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to sit here, so have fun. Goodbye. So we left, and, you know, we were dancing and joking around and talking to people. And, and every once in a while, we just wander back to check on John. We were just sitting there, just taking it all in, very happy, you know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Bye. Have fun. But then about not very long after, I'd say about an hour, so we got there maybe 9, 10, so maybe... 11, 10 or 11. The driver came around gathering there. So we're, we're going. Why? John says we're going. He wants to leave. Okay, so we gathered everybody and we're going down. Everybody's now around John. We're going downstairs. We were on the third floor. We were on the second floor. So we're going downstairs. And I remember John coming over to me and he says, Larry, do something funny. 
I go, what do you mean? He said, well, nothing happened in here. We'll do something funny. We'll film, we'll film it. I said, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Piss in the sink? <laughs> he goes, yeah, yeah, piss in the sink. That would be really great. And then he disappears. He, he goes away and he says, wait here. So we're now on the first floor and there's the bathrooms. That's why I said it. I just said, you know, oh, yeah, boy, what do you want me to do? Piss in the sink? And he goes, yeah, piss in the sink. That's great. And he goes and gets And he had a camera crew there. I didn't know that. Nobody knew that. I guess they were looking for, you know, out, uh, uh, what do you call it? Just takes that we could get. Yeah. Into. So he calls the camera crew and he says, come on, everybody. Everybody. You know, the five people and the camera crew, which came in another car. So there's four, three of those, three or four of those guys. We all gather into the men's room, the whole party. So now there's about 20 people, <laughs> camera crew and me. And he says, well, here's the sink. Okay, he's going to, Larry's going to piss in the sink. He makes this announcement to everybody. And I'm thinking, no, no, John, I was just kidding. I, you know, I'm thinking this. I'm not saying yeah. I'm going, How can I stop this? How can I find a funny way out of this? And everybody's around the sink and the camera guy's got the thing behind. So the only way I think is I can, I can fake it by turning my back to the camera because the camera was behind me. Yeah. I'm over the sink. There's a mirror. So I just pretend. I just mime pissing in the sink. And again, the cops would be pulling me off the stage about now. Okay, so I'm pissing in the sink and I'm pretending. I'm miming it. I'm just not doing it. I'm just, just like this. And John says, no, 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 no. We, we got to see it. We got to see it. And I said, I'm not going to piss in the sink, John. It's a, but the, well, what was going through my mind was not that I didn't want to do it in front of these people, which, of course, I didn't want to do. I'm, I'm shy. Uh, whatever. I, even if it's a camera and I'm getting a lot of money. I also knew that they had to pay me to do this. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm exposing myself. This is a bump up, man. So he's not talking about that. And I'm also thinking, not only am I shy, I'm not being paid for this. This is a union gig. And so yeah. I'm thinking all of those things. And he goes, all right, forget it. You know, well, you know while I'm thinking, you know, so, oh, well, I, I, you know, I don't know, John. I don't know. All right, forget it. Let's go. And now he's really angry. So that, yeah. that's, that's the mood change. He's, but he keeps it in. He's just. All right, let's go. And he gets us, and we walk out. We get into his limo. We all, the five of us, everybody gets in a limo. The driver gets in a limo, and we drive home. It's a half-hour drive back to the hotel. Not a word. And he just, with his wife and the five actors, he's just sitting in the back. The whole way. Nobody said anything. It was the, it was the worst, most silent right yeah. ever. it was it was weird man now i didn't know if it was me because you know remember he had said we're leaving yeah to so it could have been something else i don't know the whole thing might have i mean maybe he thought we're going to get some great shots and as a director he was disappointed and i'm probably that was true whatever it was me or not he would just sat there and when we got out of the car, it was a relief, man. You know, just everybody. Yeah. God, man. And nobody knew why. You know, so. And, and then a couple of days later, which has nothing to do with this, later, uh, an, an AD was missing. Uh, and I said, what happened to John? His name was John, not John Hughes. Right. I said, what happened to John, the AD, you know? Because uh, we were friends. He would come and we would talk, you know, hang out. I said, what happened to John? He said, oh, he was fired. Why? What did he do? I don't know. John fired him. John Hughes fired him. When? Yesterday. W what did he do? I don't know. Nobody knew. I, I asked around. I said, well, you know, what happened? What, what, did John do something? No, nobody knew. So, uh, again, there was this mysterious, what happened to John? Why are we leaving? All these questions. But I never got close to John. He, he's not a... Uh, I do know that he, he does get close to his stars. Yeah. I guess if he gets along with them. Because I have pictures, or I, I've seen pictures, 
of John and John Candy and um, Steve Martin, uh, which was later on in another movie, uh, Trains, Planes, and Automobiles, where, yeah. you know, they're, they're buddies, they're drinking together. You can see them in a restaurant or something, and they're all big smiles and happy. So, but I've never saw that in the two movies that I was with uh, John Hughes in. He was always very distant to everybody, not just to me. Yeah. So, I don't know, but that's and and each each director, each job is totally different. You, you know, there's no unanimity of ways to shoot a movie or a sitcom. Each director, each job is totally different, and so you gotta. That's another thing. You you gotta always be on your toes to say, oh, how is this gonna go? What kind of? And then the stars are always. Some stars like to pal around with you. Some stars don't want to talk to you. Yeah. Well, there's all this. this uh, I mean, that you know, is never talked about. Some some stars give you hints as to ha acting that if you try in another job, do you, you, you get fired for doing? Uh, I can tell you that. You, you got a, a minute to for me to tell you that that one. Sure. Yep. Uh, on, um, who is it? James Garner. I, I did. A, it was a, one of his cop shows. I think I did. He was on Gunsmoke, correct, for like twenty uh, years. Yeah. yeah, no, even before that or after that. I mean, it was an, yeah. uh, he wasn't a cowboy. He was, I don't think. No, he was in a regular suit. But in the middle, of, I'm doing a scene with him. And we're doing a scene. And in the middle of the scene, he just turns on his heel and walks out of the scene. Walks all the way around behind the camera. Now, and, and he comes back and he walks back into the scene. Now, nobody said anything. See, that was the weird thing. Um, he just acting, acting, blah, blah, blah. And then he just walks out of the scene. No, nobody said what happened. I'm, he left me there on the set all alone in front of the camera, you know, and the, and the director's cut and they wait for him. You know, everybody just, this is like, it's normal. Right. He walks all the way around the camera and he comes back into the scene and he goes, oh, let's do it again. Director says, okay, let's do it again. All right, and action. And we do the scene again. And he goes all the way through it. And the director yells, cut. And I go, hey. And I go over to him and I say, what was that all about? He goes, what was what all about? I go in the middle of the scene. You just walked out, walked around the camera, and nobody said anything. Nobody, they just like waited for you to walk back into the scene. What was that all about? He said, oh, that. He said, oh, well, you know, you know, time is money around here. You know, we're, we're doing a sitcom. He said, so if a scene is going like I don't like it, like if I don't feel like I'm in it, you know, if it's not working for me, he said, I walk out of the scene immediately because time is money around here. So if I finish the scene, even if it didn't feel good to me, they'll use it. They don't care. Hey, time is yeah. money, man. Let's get on to the next set. So I have to, to protect my performance, I have to walk out of the scene because I'm the star. If you fuck up, they'll just, they won't use it. You know, uh, or, or I don't even think he, he said that. He said, all I know is if I, I'm the star, they're going to use it if I finish it. They don't yeah. need anything. So I have to walk out of the scene. Or they'll use it. And I said, oh, great. And I registered that. And I said, great. Here's a hint that a great actor has told me about, or a star. I don't know if he's a great actor, but he's, he's good. He knows what he's doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. So the next job I got, I'm in a scene with the star. <coughs> I don't remember who it was. I'm in a scene. And I, I feel the scene is not going my way. I, I, I'm not doing a good job. I, I don't like what, how I'm acting. So in the middle of the scene, I stop and I walk out, walk out around the camera, and, and all of a sudden, this place goes berserk. What the fuck are you doing, man? What did you walk out of the scene for? People are yelling and going, oh, man, you know. People are going, what? And I go, well, I didn't like the way it was going, so I just walked out. No, you don't walk out of the scene. Who the fuck do you think you are? I mean... Yeah. So 
It was a yeah, lesson learned. Again, yeah. this naivete of me. Oh, well, he said it was okay to, no, you're not a star, man. That, that was for his set. He's a star over there. This is different. I never, you know, so sometimes you can carry stuff to the next job. Sometimes you better not. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and all those things. So my, that's why it's a quirky book. If you, if you, if you read the book, you'll find out that this guy is not doing it the way I think it's supposed to be done. You know, because weird things are happening to Larry Hankin in this book. Either he's yeah. causing it or it's happening in his wake. But something is not right here. Every job is something funny going on. Yeah. So, you know, can you can start to understand why I was thinking, well, now I know why I never wanted to be an actor, but I, I am one now and I got to just deal with it. Uh, so by the end, I thought, I, OK, I learned everything I need to know. It's time to quit. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me ask you, Larry. I mean, uh, were there any shows or films that you really enjoyed more so than the others? I mean, I, I mentioned Seinfeld, Friends. I mean, that was some tremendous writing, funny shows. Uh, I mean, Breaking Bad is an iconic show. Just talk to me a little bit. I mean, what were some of your favorite things to do? Well, the, the most favorite and, and the most fun I ever had, <laughs> And that was uh, because it was three months long. It was a three-month shoot. Was Escape from Alcatraz, and that was pretty much the first yeah. job I ever had. But my acting in it—I've checked it several times—is is just wonderful. I mean, it's it's so natural, uh, and I didn't know what I was doing, which was the quiet requirement of the part and and acting. I was totally relaxed. I was. Pay, being paid an incredible amount of money, more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And, uh, you know, I was with Clint Eastwood and Don Siegel, who they just related to me like uh, a little brother or, or a grandfather. Don Siegel treated me like a grandson, and Clint Eastwood treated me like a little brother. You know, like, uh, hey, hey, Larry, come here, you know. Yeah. And you worked with him in the prime of his career. I mean, he had really taken off by that point. So, I mean, you got to oh, work yeah. with Clint right where he was like the best action star at the time. Uh, yeah, he was incredibly famous. And that was his, uh, at one point, I, I kept on hanging around Clint and Don. And I and Don would talk to me. I could talk to, to Don Siegel. You know, I could ask him questions. You know, why are you putting the camera here? You know, uh, what What are you doing here? You know, why is that? And sometimes he would just, you know, put me on. He would do that a lot. You know, he would just shake his head. He'd go, I don't know, Larry. I think I'm going to be fired for this one. Yeah. And, you know, he just, uh, uh, or sometimes he would, he would tell me. Um, and, 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 and Clint would just put up with me following him around. Hey, here's a little no, no, unknown fact. Trivia fact about Clint Eastwood that nobody I've ever seen or, or read or anything about him have, have ever mentioned about him. He's a savant of Lear's limericks. Oh, really? Wow. What he would do to because he would always, he never went to his dressing room. He always hung around with the, with the extras, the, the, the convicts, the 200 yeah. extras. He would eat lunch with them. So, and I would eat lunch with Clint. So I would always eat lunch with them. I would always sit at Clint's table with them. And, and, and so to entertain them, because they were always peppering him with questions, uh, he would just steer them towards Lear's limerick. So they would always ask him questions about, you know, hey, do you know Lear's limerick about dogs? Boom. And he would just come up with one. And so that was the whole, the stump Clint. I've never seen it done in the three months I was there. Now, I didn't eat lunch with him every day for three months. Yeah. But every time I had lunch with him, they never stumped him. Never. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. just they do one about, and you go, there was a man from St. Ives who had seven wives. And then, boom, he was into it. it just, I, I thought, that was amazing. Nobody knows about this. How, how does he? Uh, so, yeah, so that was my favorite. Uh, Seinfeld doing Kramer, imitating. Yeah. Kramer was that? Uh, 
my favorite thing of being an actor. I got to do that. That was funny, uh, fun. Um, and uh, Mr. Heckles doing Mr. Heckles. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, but I, I but I didn't like uh, not that I didn't like. I mean, but but I never got along with the with the cast or the crew. I mean, we never talked. Uh, uh, they just huddled together, you know, and you, you couldn't get in there. Uh, so those those two, uh, what was the most fun? Uh, let's see, Seinfeld, Kramer, Friends, Breaking Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad because Old Joe was the best, you know. Oh, oh, doing Old Joe because uh, I was doing my my Uncle Murray. I, I had somebody <laughs> in mind, you know, and my yeah. Uncle Murray. So and he dressed the same way. My Uncle Murray. Uh, installed oil burners. So he wore the coveralls. He was always covered in grease. He looked exactly like old Joe. Uh, so I like, and because of the iconic television show that it was and yeah. getting to talk to Vince Gilligan and uh, Brian, working with Brian Cranston. So that was, you know, kind of cool. But again, when they interviewed me, uh, they were doing a, a, an interview for the movie coming up, Vince Gilligan knew that in one of these shows that I was doing, that he was thinking about doing a movie for some reason, you know, uh, that that's where he was going with this. So they had a crew, a camera crew, come to the set of Breaking Bad, the TV show. And the one that I did, the last one that I did, which is the third year, I think. And... Uh, they interviewed me and and uh, the guy who finally got shot and died, but he's now in the in the new yeah. thing, uh, the older guy. I, I forgot his name. But anyway, they interviewed me and him together. Uh, it was just for a documentary that they were going to do, so there was no. It wasn't very specific why they were doing the movie. We, we I didn't know. It was just there was a camera crew on set interviewing all the actors. And they just interviewed me and him together. So this is now three years into Breaking Bad. So I was now an experienced actor now. So I wasn't naive. So I thought, I thought, you know, I knew it. I know my way around. It. So they interviewed me and him. So first they interviewed him. Cool. No, no. First they interviewed me. That was the whole point. First they interviewed me. You know, and then he would st he was standing right next to me. And then they figured, all right, no, when we finish, Larry, we'll get to you. Okay, well, so we do me first. Do the lesser actor first. To, you know, so the, uh, the senior actor can see what's going on. So they interviewed me, and, I, and just I would look over to him, and I could see he was getting depressed. He's going, oh, man, you know, like that, rolling his eyes and going, oh, Jesus. And then they did his, his and it was totally different. It was very together, his uh, thing, and very actorish, very businesslike, really cool. Not like me wandering all over the place, not knowing <laughs> what to talk about. And then that night, we were both, now we were in the desert, so we needed a ride to get back to civilization. So me and him got to ride in this van together. And I'm trying to make conversation because it's just the, the, the driver was a woman. He sat up front with her and I sat right behind in, in the back seat. And he's trying to hit on her and I'm making idle conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it until about three quarters of the way through because his idle conversation, my idle conversation, his conversation, I noticed, was getting less and less and more irritable. But he was really trying to hit on her. And she was trying to, like, you know, dodge and weave. You know, she didn't want to get involved. I guess because there was a guy sitting back there listening to all this. So she didn't want to get involved with this. And it was reported. She was flirting, whatever. She didn't want to have anything to do with him. And he was laying it all on me. Because he wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the time. The next day, he was just... Uh -huh. So I thought, oh, well, I haven't learned everything yet. You know, just shut your mouth, Larry. Just stop it. <laughs> just always <laughs> doing something, bugging somebody. 
I just couldn't get the right combination all at once together at one time. Yeah. But think about this, Larry. I mean, if somebody were to turn, you know, type, go to Hulu or Prime Video, whatever it might be, and they type in a certain movie, there's a good chance you'll be in it, whether it's Home Alone. Oh, yeah, here, right, right. You know, I mean, you're always on TV every single day. And then you think about the shows that you guest starred in. So maybe like in some people's eyes, you weren't this superstar actor. But you were a very successful actor because. Oh yeah, you, no, no. I yeah. mean, I did a good job. Yeah. You know, if I look back on it, and I don't tell these stories about it, no, it's it's great. It's a great uh, what do you call over? I guess you know. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, a great thing together. And I here's here's the bottom line. I, I, okay, I'll get, this I never mentioned this to anybody because it seems so silly, but it, it's come up here. Um, when I thought about acting, if I ever thought about acting, uh, when I was a kid, I thought, well, um, I, I didn't dream about acting. What I dreamt about in the future, if there ever, you know, if I could think about that, I thought, well, one day, you know, they're going to send a ship because I, kn I knew when I was growing up, they sent into space a gold record. I don't know if you remember this. Maybe you were too young. But they sent out into space a gold record, and on it inscribed, um, not printed, but inscribed, was where we were in the universe, our solar system, so that if somebody else ever found it, they could find our planet. But it was inscribed on it, where in the universe, where in, in our universe, what planet we were on. And then it also had a couple of messages that should be able to be interpreted by some odd alien life form. And they sent it out into space and they said, hey, maybe somebody someday in eons and millions of years will find this and know that we were here once. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. That, that got my imagination. So I thought, well, and then they buried something, a time capsule with all the stuff in it from this particular era, and they'll find that someday. And I thought, oh, that's cool. So someday they're going to send a ship with that, <laughs> with that capsule. We'll get enough, a big enough ship to get that capsule. No, there was only one record. We could only send, that was as big as we could send out into space back in the day. Yeah. The record, that was it. But I thought, you know, someday they'll have a big enough spaceship to put, the time capsule that they buried out into space and maybe somebody will find it. And I wanted to be on that time capsule that would be sent in space. I wanted to be on that time capsule. Now, it never occurred to me, well, how do you do that? I mean, you're going to be dead. I mean, what are you talking about? I never, it didn't, I wanted to be on it. And then I figured, you know, when I was doing the, all these movies and going to <coughs> naivete i thought wait a minute if i did all these movies and tv shows one of them might be encapsulated in the time capsule i made it yeah <laughs> i mean there's a good chance if i only did one great movie it wouldn't be on there but if i did like 200 one of them might be on there they're all kind of some of them are, are iconic TV shows or movies. Yeah. You know, figure maybe Clint Eastwood's work would be on there. You know, if, if they if they did, if they put on Friends, you know, the, 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 the entire series, maybe. So, you know, maybe it's a good thing. You know, maybe it turns out for the better, you know? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's definitely been a successful career. I mean, oh, the, oh yeah, but here's the but bottom line. You're still working to this day. And that, to me, well, now, now, okay, that's over. In other yeah. words, I wrote a book now. So no, this is the beginning, not the end. Now I, I feel now this is the beginning. I I finished. A, I've had several. You know, I went to college. I was a stand-up comedian. I was an actor. I wrote a book. Yeah. I produced some movies, and now um, I think I'm going to do a stage show of the book. 
Wow. I think that's where it's going next. And where can uh, people yeah. buy the book, Larry? Uh, well, I, Amazon.com is the easiest way. Yeah. Right. You can go on Patreon, I think. Patreon.com slash Larry Hankin. One word, Larry Hankin. That. Or, you know, Bear Manor Media. You can buy it on there. But Amazon.com, real easy. And give right. me a gold star. Amazon loves yeah. gold stars. Kindergarten and Amazon.com. Gold stars. Oh, you they know what? It. That that completes a great career. And um, Larry, I want to thank you for giving me the time today. I really do appreciate it. Thanks. It's an honor for me. I mean, your career speaks for itself. But uh, I love what you did in your career. And I love that you are still motivated to keep working because that to me is what makes the perfect life. So thank you again for coming on and congratulations on a wonderful career. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank <laughs> really you. Well, folks, it's good being here. Yeah, well, folks, there you have it. I mentioned it before. If you talk about films such as Running Scared, Billy Madison, Breaking Bad, Seinfeld, Friends, um, you know, uh, WKRP Cincinnati. I mean, I could go oh. on and on. Pretty Woman. I mean, this Home Alone. This guy's had a collection of films and TV series that he's done. And yes, you may look at people sometimes and say, well, they were minor characters. But you know what? In my eyes, he's one of the biggest stars in TV because he has stood the test of time for over 50 plus years. That to me says all you need to know about Larry Hankin. For In the Spotlight, I'm Mike Kanishi saying good night, everyone. Take it easy.